uh, if you have that sort of sort of perfectionist mentality which we probably all share to some extent and that's why we're dentists then you might uh, you might struggle uh, mentally if, if you can't be good at all of that so even if you don't want to specialize you know just pick those areas of interest that you you think you're good at and that interests you and, and you know makes you excited uh, and even if you're physically tired after if, if after a procedure at least you're you know mentally satisfied that you you have done that and you have done it better than last time if, if, if you're going through that i think you're in the right direction hey guys welcome to the cp junkie podcast where we bring you interviews with dentists sharing their cpd stories and journeys from around australia Greetings CPD Junkie Podcast fam, I'm your host Lawrence Doan and today we are joined by Dr. Hassan Malati. Dr. Malati is a periodontist in private practice in Sydney and a founder of state-of-the-art precision periodontics in Chatswood. His practice is restricted to periodontics and implant dentistry. He is an honorary clinical lecturer at Sydney University and is also involved in mentorship at several graduate level diplomas and courses. He's a recipient of the prestigious ITI grant for his postgraduate thesis focusing on healing of hard and soft tissues around implant, immediate implants. He has published several articles in well-respected international journals and has been actively involved in presenting lectures, running CPD events and teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students and overseas trained dentists. Dr. Sam Malati, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. So I want to dive into your CPD journey and how it all kind of started. Sure. Um, well, I guess uh, if I want to go a little bit further back, uh, I'll probably have to give a bit of a background uh, about my sort of, um, you know, the education undergrads and postgrads. So I, I did my undergrad training uh, back in my home country, Iran, and, and then um, uh, after graduation, I pretty much almost straight away sort of delved into uh, the, the process to, to migrate to Australia. So I started the process of the ADC examination. So I didn't get to do much CPD back home because, you know, I, I pretty much started to, 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 to go through the process to come here. So, uh, uh, but then since, um, uh, you know, arriving in Australia, Firstly, as a general dentist, and then when I sort of um, started my postgrad, that's pretty much when I uh, got more involved in, in you know continuing professional uh, development, and and uh, and and um, because you know I, I, I probably worked here as a general dentist in Australia about a year and a half. Uh, and, and then got straight into postgrad. So most of my experience actually comes as a you know uh, basically a, a during the postgrad and and afterwards as a, as a specialist. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me because a lot of our previous guests talked to us about how difficult the ADC exam is. You know, <laughs> um, you know if especially if English isn't the first, and then the yep. different criteria and expectations. Talk to me about your experience with the ADC exam. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a difficult process. I mean, it's a three-step process. The, the the English exam, you know, um, um, even though that it's you know my English has always been good, let, let's say, but but you know, it's still sitting at an an exam and, and you know talking about uh, you know uh, whether or, or you know some something that is not really um, uh, you know you you talk about or think about on a daily basis. It it, it can be a bit. Uh, a bit hard and um, especially that you know my, my English was more like into the dentistry like so with reading textbooks and then maybe uh, more involved in, in dental environment so when it comes to doing a, a general sort of English exam I think even some of the native speakers might might struggle to to get good marks in some of the English exams because it you know it's something that you you know you don't really deal with on a day, daily basis but then uh, well, thankfully that was good, and and then <clears throat> the two steps of the um, there's a written exam. <clears throat> uh, it all it all it all sort of has changed since because I did that back in 2009, so it's uh, it's quite a long time now. <clears throat> um, back then, I did my written exam in 2008, and then uh, the clinical exam in 2009, um, which back then it was actually six days uh, of. Uh, Wow. Uh, sort of yes, yeah, so a sort of OSCE type examination. Um, 
uh, patients and and uh, uh, Viva and all that. So it was it was quite a journey. That six days, you know, it was pretty much like a boot camp. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the, yeah, and and the pass rate was 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 quite low. Uh, uh, around probably around 15 to 20 percent so I remember in, in the in the venue uh, that we had the exam which was actually uh, UQ we did it in UQ um, in the, um, uh, the 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 old dental school I think maybe it has it has sort of moved to a new place now the one in Tarbot Street if, if people from from Queensland would know um, uh, basically uh um at the time um you know six days you know i just had a hotel near near the the the, <laughs> the, the, the dental school and just going in and out and you know yeah it, it was tough and and we had uh, about 25 people and i think there were there were only four of us who passed straight and some got supplementary which you know they could they needed to sort of redo some parts of the exam uh, but thankfully, I, I passed all three steps in in my first attempt, and 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 managed to sort of um, to get registered fairly quickly. Wow! So then, after you passed through that stressful period, right? You coming out to work? Did you work in public and private sectors at the same time? Around A that good time? question. Actually, no. I I I I mainly worked in in uh, public before getting into. Uh, uh, getting into post grad, um, uh, at that time, I just you know basically came here with a work visa initially and and i was still not a citizen so um and because i've always had this sort of um, um interest and love for perio i even did a um my undergrad thesis um in in, in perio and i was always uh, uh, hanging around perio postgrads at the time and and basically whenever they needed you know someone to assist you know i was always there so i and, you know, basically was was normal flora of, of the period department <laughs> in my undergrad days. So um, so that's why I always I sort of I knew what I wanted to do period. Um, and that's why as soon as I got here, I basically followed the, the process um, sort of a bit seriously uh, to get into perio. And for me at that point, I think I just needed a a fairly secure, uh, you know, workplace and and a sort of a, a salary income. I wasn't really into making money during that year or two before I get into postgrad. So, uh, and and public system was, you know, you know, was good for, from that aspect. It also um, <clears throat> helped me to sort of uh, to transition sort of fairly smoothly into the uh, postgrad system because it's still it's sort of a a public system. I mean, I, I did it through Melbourne, um, and in Melbourne um, back then we were uh, working at the Royal Dental Hospital um, of Melbourne, and we were seeing basically public patients. So uh, what I learned in, in the public dentistry as a general dentist or a dental officer helped me to to, um, to you know to transition smoothly into postgrad because the software was the same and the system was the same and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying uh, very early on, you already knew you kind of wanted to specialize in perio or was that something that you kind of developed later on? How did you, and if so, how did you decide that perio was the one that you wanted to be in? Sure. Uh, I think early on, I realized that I like surgery. Um, and, um, and then as we were going through the, you know, the year of, uh, three of dentistry because back 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 home it was basically a six-year degree and then the, the first two years were pretty much basic sciences so basically the dental um units were um uh, starting from year three so um you know by the end of year three or maybe early on in year four where we were exposed to dental topics perio oral surge you know endo restorative and all that i you know started developing this interest into surgery and and um and then soon after, I re realized that uh, um, the, the pretty much two pathways, you know, uh, for surgery, if you want to do surgery as a dentist, um, the one would be perio, one would be going into oral surge or max fax. Um, and that's, um, and max fax, um, similar to sort of similar to here, where you, you have to be um, um, you have to do some medicine as well to, to get into max fax or you, yeah. So I, I didn't really want to go that far because, uh, I chose 
to do dentistry um, because I didn't want to do medicine. My brother is a, is a, is a medical doctor and, and he was older than me. So um, I knew exactly that pathway. So uh, I chose to do dentistry because I wanted to, to work with my hands or make basically, you know, focusing in one sort of smaller area. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so that then the perio would be the, the way to go. And that's how I got involved more into perio and, and you know, talking to postgrads and, and um, assisting and, and, and being there, you know, all the time on my free time to, and, and, and then once you get a, you, you get exposed to those surgical procedures as an undergrad, it's actually quite, quite exciting um, because you, you get to see that the theoretical part, but you don't really get to see the, the, the you know, the, the procedures in action. And, and then when you see them in action, that's actually quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm reflecting my own um, undergraduate journey. Definitely, it was a lot of theory, but there wasn't a practical procedure where we actually got to see it in, like, live and um, be part of it. And so, um, Mm -hmm. I can imagine when you were sitting there and assisting, it was completely different. That's right, exactly, exactly. (laughs) So, so you're going, you're working at the hospital and then you're thinking in the back of your mind, I need to prepare, I'm I'm thinking of specializing. Is this what's happening? And so you're going and doing your primaries. Are you doing other things along the way to kind of um, assist you or to kind of uh, maybe show uh, that you have developing interest in the perio um, prior? Like, talk to me about that. Cool. Um, yeah, so I, um, when I was doing my undergrad, um, I got introduced to, I mean, we had, we had a professor um, fairly young back then, I think he was in his early 40s, and he had uh, done, young. his yeah, he had done his PhD in uh, uh, Glasgow and, and just came back uh, to do his, his public service or whatever, and, and then, so he was, um, he was, you know, just a year or two into the academic environment of our, our union and he was very fresh and very bright minded guy and, and then so um I, I i you know after listening to a few of his you know lectures for us i sort of uh, realized that well this is this is probably the guy that i have to you know to learn from and 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 to to try to you know get inspired by um and he had you know excellent level of english so everything was 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 spot on so um I remember I, because at, at around year four, um, <clears throat> in our six year journey, dental journey, <clears throat> we uh, needed to, to, to choose our thesis topic because we had a, our degree was DDS, like the DDS that we have here. So you know, we had to do a, like a minor thesis. Mm. Uh, so we had to choose a topic. So m- most students were, you know, choosing something simple, you know, just do like a lit review or something to just, you know, be able to graduate quickly but um i think for me it was like oh you know what you know it's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity that i can do something uh, proper and, and then potentially um you know getting some benefit out of it down the track you know um, <clears throat> rather than just doing, doing something simple and graduate faster um so i i approached him uh, i still quite remember that day that uh, he was sitting in, in, in the in the period department uh, and, and the students were working and he was just sitting there you know waiting for anyone to need needing help to to go and and help them and and I sort of approached him and uh, and I said you know what uh, prof I want to do my thesis with you and at, at that point he was only really supervising postgrad <laughs> students he, he, <laughs> so undergrads were not really approaching him so he, he looked at me. And I was like, you can imagine, I was like a 22 year old, you know, <laughs> just, and he was like, um, are you sure? I, like, I said, yeah, well, I like Perio and I, you know, I, I really want to do something, um, you know, just bigger than a lit reviews. Um, and, and then he, um, <clears throat> uh, so obviously we, we you know, the, 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 uh, we weren't speaking English at the, at, at uni, we were speaking yeah, uh, Persian, my, my background is from Iran. And, and then, so he, he had this uh, Lindy textbook in front of him and then he sort of uh, pushed it towards me and said, all right, um, just um, read this two paragraph and translate it to me. And, and I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I just read it and then translated back. And, and then 
and say, okay, yeah, yeah, it looks like your English is good. So um, <laughs> let, let me have a, have a bit of a think about it. And, and then sort of he later, but that was pretty much the start. I think, I think somehow he liked me. And, and then, so uh, he got me into um, a, 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 a research that we're, they were doing at the time, mostly involving postgrads that they were doing, basically looking at the uh, genetic sort of relationship between perio um, or, or the genetics of the perio, basically. So it was, and, and then through that, I got in into uh, a, a research facility uh, that were, you know, uh, outside of the uni that uh, like a private contractor. So, uh, uh, and that basically, um, helped me to get in to know a lot of other people, uh, which then, you know, probably played a good role or important role in, in you know, how my thought process sort of developed. Um, and, and out of that uh, <clears throat> uh, research project, I managed to actually get a publication out of it, um, which was which which was pretty unique back then as an undergrad to to actually have a publication. So I mean, it ended up getting published one, one, when I graduated, but um, but even like as as a general dentist. So um, <clears throat> and then through that, uh, the the links and and the people that I knew, I continued uh, cooperating with them in their research projects um even after uni during that few years that i was going through the uh, the adc process and and so I, eventually when i got here uh, and um <clears throat> and wanted to do uh, perio uh, at that point i had like five publications or contributed in five publications mm. um all all pretty much perio related or um, perio oral surgery related so um, I think that helped a lot. So that I think that was a uh, probably a, a good proof that I had this sort of genuine interest into perio. Um, uh, most of my other colleagues were probably making money at that time, and I was spending time at the research facility, you know, looking at the um, uh, poly polymorphism of the gene genes and all that. Which <laughs> back back then people were thinking that's just a uh, you know, probably nonsense, but I think for, for me, I've followed my interest and I, I think it paid off. So it all started from reading two paragraphs to the professor. <laughs> hey? <laughs> so you say you did, you did, you had a fair few publications for you at that point. So did you have to do the primaries before you applied to do the specialist program or did you go? Question. So, <clears throat> um, uh, I didn't end up doing it because, uh, <clears throat> at the time, I think a year or two prior to um, <clears throat> me applying um, for postgrad in Melbourne, um, um, they, they had this uh, agreement with college that um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think it sort of terminated one or two years prior to that. So it wasn't a, a prerequisite, but obviously it was highly regarded. So, um, and, and then when I met the, uh, uh, the professor, uh, the head of Perio at, at uh, Melbourne Uni, um, and sort of he had to look at my resume, you know, he said, well, uh, um, I think what you have in your resume is probably already equivalent of, of uh, the, uh, the primaries because that the main aim, you know, aim of primary is just, you know, to show that you, you want to do something more than general dentistry and, and you're dedicated and you're committed to to further education, I think you already have that those sort of tick boxes ticked. Um, however, you know, uh, people, other people will, will apply, and you know, they will have, you know, um, strong resumes as well. So if you if you can do a primary, that obviously will be another positive point for you. But I think time wise, it just didn't uh, didn't happen because uh, <clears throat> I think it was a bit too late um, to get into the the training course and then. So it's just with the primary, the timing of the exam and all that, it just didn't happen. And, um, and, and I sort of tried my luck uh, and, and thankfully it worked. And so I didn't end up needing it. But if, if I wasn't able to get into period that first year, my plan was to do, to do primaries yeah, for, the, mm. for, the, for the next try. Yeah. yeah, but to your point, like, you know, a lot of people think that to specialize, you have to do the primaries. But to your point, if you can demonstrate that you have an actual interest in it, um, in that field by through other means, you can also demonstrate um, your interest in it. Yeah, yeah. There are <clears throat> there are some some unis that 
uh, or for some disciplines that uh, it's a prerequisite. So you have to have it if you want to apply. So I think it's a um, it's certainly not a, a universal um, uh, thing or not not a not a mutual thing between unis. I think it's very dependent on on the the course convener or, or the uni routes uh, for that matter. Um, yeah, but if, if it's not prerequisite, then um, obviously, you know, if you can demonstrate somehow that uh, some sort of, uh, uh, the, you know, um, qualification or, or, or something that is considered or regarded as equivalent, yeah, that can that can work. Yeah. So you made you 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 you're working in Melbourne. You make it into Melbourne. Yeah. In specialising, you're in the program now. What happens? <clears throat> Well, it How was, did you find it? Yeah, um, it was quite different. I mean, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, one of the main differences was that our education system back in Iran was very, um, very much like in the American system. I think it was based on that. So, um, whereas um, you know, most of the unis in Australia is, is probably more like European type. Um, and, and that in itself is 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 quite different, especially in 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 a field like Perio, um, and that also demonstrates it, it itself now that I'm as as a, as a periodontist, I can pretty much by looking at people's work, I can tell whether they have been taught in the school of thoughts of of a, of a you know, sort of European type Perio uh, or, or American type Perio. Um, so for me, with that sort of more like an American type background uh, of education starting a, a more european type background education was was a bit uh, tough to adjust uh so I, I think uh out of the three year period the first year i was a bit confused and i was just trying to find out uh, you know how to you know how to read what to read you know um it was it was a bit vague for me i mean now i understand it but but back then it was it was a bit vague because uh uh, I, I think the American base is very textbook base. Um, so text, textbook is like the, the Bible and you have to, you know, know the ins and out of it. And, 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 and if you know, then, then you're pretty much fine. But, but, um, but the European system is more about articles and, and papers and all that. And then as a first year postgrad, you start reading and you just get confused because there's a lot of conflicting evidence and, <laughs> You know, you just uh, you just read through a paper and you think you understand something, and then at the end of it, the conclusion is that there is no solid evidence and there's further research needed. So it just uh, at that point, I think you you want or you you prefer to have something like a very streamlined, very straightforward to to shape your mind. But but that difference in system is that you actually your mind actually gets um, prepared to 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 think outside of the box and and. And, and probably look at the, uh, the 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 science, you know, in the real way that it's it's just a, a try and error, and you know most of it is just um, you know based on 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 some evidence, and maybe there's not enough evidence on some of them, and then you just have to find your way. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, and then so you're finding your way through the the three years, right? As yeah. as most um, special uh, gra- uh, postgraduates will find yeah. it. Um, did you find it challenging? It was kind of okay. Was how were the hours like? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> it was challenging because, um, um, well, first of all, you know, financially, it's it's always a challenge to do postgrad. Uh, I mean, some unis, I think there is a, um, um, I think they there's a, you know you you may not even pay tuition fee uh, or you may even get paid uh, as a, as a registrar, for example, but, but in Melbourne, I think we, we didn't really have that system back then. I think they're, they're probably going through some changes now, but, but basically we have, we had to pay, you know, a hefty tuition fee. Um, and at the same time, you, you couldn't really work because, you know, I was, I was just doing um, half day Saturdays uh, at a dental practice close to home. And um, I specifically requested I don't want to do anything complex because I, I just don't want to. to You're fine. That. Yeah, I just want to come here, you know, eight o'clock to two p.m. Just see checkup cleans and and bite wings, and then that's it. So, uh, and if there's anything, if there's a crown needed, if root canal needed, you guys can handle it. So I just refer to you, say, uh, yeah. 
I just wanted, you know, just a, a fairly smooth um, uh, income to come through just to, 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 to help us to get through it. And at, at the time, my wife was doing her PhD at Monash University. And so she was basically doing postgrad as well. Um, she had, thankfully, she had uh, scholarships so that that was helping. But, uh, but, but, uh, but even then, I mean, financially, it's always a, a big commitment. Uh, um, and, and you pretty much just try to, uh, you know, to, to have the ends meet and, and just trying to go through that, that three year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talk to me about that. Cause you know, that's for a lot of um, people that are thinking about it, you know, mm. they've graduated from university, undergraduate, massive school debt. Right. Yeah. Then they're going to contemplate another three years of it. And mm. right. And to your point, your partner is also like, how does that discussion with your partner kind of go? What's your, what are you thinking? And yeah, well, I think one, um, probably one, one thing in, in our favor was that I didn't have an undergrad debt, um, because I, I, I didn't study here. So for my undergrad so I, I think that was something but at, at, at the same time i didn't have the, the the family support that you know you you can potentially get here if you are living here or you're born here and and you know you have the family here because you know you know some people if they're living in they or studying in postgrad in their own uh, city that their family are living maybe they can just move in with parents and you know but you know just just do something that you know so that they don't have to, to pay rent and etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh but for us, um, <clears throat> um, I think I, 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 I had this huge interest for Perio that I, I was ready to, to sacrifice for a few years. And um, even though that, you know, financially, it definitely pays off um, eventually. But uh, I think back then I was like, you know, I want to follow my interest. Um, and, um, you know, I might financially be a few years behind but but you know in, in the long term it probably doesn't matter i think if, if you if you if you make few, uh, if you make a uh, uh, few uh, you know good financial decisions down the track you know in, in other aspects of the life like property and etc and etc you know you can well you know compensate that you know and then so um and there is this time i think there's this golden time that is um <clears throat> I believe that exists. I mean, there, there are some people that get into postgrad at, at a later age and they can still be, uh, you know, go through it successfully and, and, and be very successful. But I think for majority of people, um, if you want to do postgrad, I think you, you have to, you have to at least get in, get into it before the age of 30. Um, because then, then other life commitments come, come, in, come into place. You know, you, you get married, you know, the, the prospect of having kids and, and all that. And then as you become more and more involved in a, in a bit of a more committed life, then there are, you know, other financial commitments. Basically, just they just get worse and worse over time. They don't get easier. So uh, unless you have a, you know, a, a very rich family that you can support you throughout the whole process and even, even afterwards, I think the sooner you get into it, uh, it's probably, probably better and easier because you're less committed financially. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of the people in my demographics um, are female, right? And they have to consider these things that it's not a three years that they have to take yeah, on. Yeah. That's exactly true. Yeah, yeah. And that was the same for, for my wife because uh, um, she was doing show. So her PhD actually took five years. So more, more a lot more than mine. That was three years. And and uh, um, I mean, if um, if she had not done it, at that time, I think, and we left it maybe for another few years, she probably, you know, couldn't have done it at all because of, you know, other things that happen in life. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going through the uni, uh, you're going through the under, uh, the postgraduate course, right? In, in, uh, perio, historically, it didn't involve a lot of implants, you know, it was a lot more um, the clean, the, the grafting, all of that. Mm -hmm. Talk to me how you've kind of seen that trans transition over time and yeah if that kind of uh was incorporated into the program as well um <clears throat> i think I, I started perio in the um in the era that implants were already into the perio programs uh, probably um you know actively um maybe five six years 
prior to me, maybe it wasn't uh, like that. But um, so I, I think it was sort of lucky and fortunate from that aspect that so we had formal training about uh, uh, about implants and, and we had uh, uh, very good, um, you know, mentors and, and, uh, um, and, you know, some very well respected internationally. So um uh, so that that certainly quite you know helped quite a lot but mm. um I, I think with uh, <clears throat> with perio and implants if i mean perio um <clears throat> more talking about the, the the more advanced sort of uh, grafting type uh, you know procedures not just the non-surgical perio um it, it's it's such a um evolving um um field that um you know, I'm probably biased, but I think uh, out of all the other specialties, the, the, the way that, you know, perio has changed over the past 10, 15 years is just crazy. And, you know, there's probably not, not, not a great deal has changed in, in, for example, endo or, or peds or you know, maybe restorative. Yes. Also that's, there's a lot of new materials, techniques and innovations, but I, I think perio is one of the ones that um, there's been massive changes and, and, um, um, uh, and for me, uh, that I graduated in 2011, and now um, uh, basically I'm, you know, just past the 10 years uh, um, being a periodontist. So that's um, <clears throat> that basically uh, a, uh, that was an issue that um, I needed to up, you know, keep myself updated uh, because things were changing so rapidly. So um, I, I thought that I'm quite up to date, you know. Uh, uh, but then soon after, like it, like two years after graduation, I, I was just like, man, this, this is what is happening around me. I'm, I'm, I'm considered a, a fresh graduate and I'm, you know, I'm hearing things and I'm seeing things that I haven't been exposed to during, during postgrad. So, um, and, and that journey of, of learning is basically, uh, I thought that it ended once I finished, <laughs> finished this perio and, and then submitted my thesis, but apparently it's not, and it's just a starting point, and and st it's still the same for me. I mean, there's there are certain things and certain procedures that probably haven't changed much over the past few decades, but there are other other parts of perio and implant that are continually changing, and and I have to even as a specialist, I have to keep myself updated with that. I have to read. I have to, you know, uh, uh, attend conferences, and you know watch um you know you know live videos and and uh you know from from the people's uh, uh, opinion leaders and experts and then basically keep myself updated all the time yeah because it's interesting that you mentioned that during your undergrad you already had the implants kind of training you there because when i went through it oh, sorry you... um, no 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 uh, i i thought you were asking you... about the postgrad yeah the, okay the postgrad yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not through through undergrad, not really, no. So um um I think because my I started my undergrad in nineteen ninety nine and finished in two thousand five. Um I, I mean we, we had some theoretical um some theory about implants and I probably observed postgrads at the time, you know, placing few implants and uh, but even back then I think there were even postgrads only had few mentors, you know, probably out of a dozen that they were happy to supervise or they were experienced enough to supervise for implants. So, um, but that was during the undergrad I'm talking about. So um, <clears throat> as an undergrad, no, I wasn't really exposed to implants much. It was mostly afterwards and during postgrad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because like, I think when I think back to when I was learning about perio back at uni, it was very little about implants. Like I said to you earlier, it was about grafting the, the you know, the cleaning and all of that. It wasn't until I kind of, came out and they're kind of seeing this perio field kind of develop and kind of go into more of these kind of aspects because you know as they say you know soft tissue is the issue and that's how yeah. the yeah. field is kind of growing mm -hmm. um but okay so let's let's talk about you graduated now okay mm -hmm. so what's it like to graduate as a specialist you know do do you prefer to set up your own shop work for someone else first or work with a team of specialists like mm -hmm. what happens well, yeah, then, then the next challenge begins. And, and then <laughs> um, the, the, well, the, the thing is that most of the uh, dental specialties are, are referral based. So that's, um, um, and that's something that you, you probably don't 
realize the importance of it until until you're out and and, and uh, so that requires you know uh, even if you are the best periodontist in the world i mean people have to know you you know to 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 refer to you and you know you have to you have to then basically introduce yourself and and uh, and, and let people know what you do and 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 uh, um, and be involved and and so that's again start of a, a process of uh, um, you know that which which you know as, as a sort of new graduate uh, specialist uh, it's it, it takes some time it takes you know at least a few years so that you you find your foot and you you have uh, um, people trusting you and there's, there's always um, people that are you know much more senior than you and and uh, so um, as someone young and, and uh, the new kid in the block, obviously, you know, uh, you know, you have to prove yourself so that people are convinced to, to refer to you. Um, uh, you know, you, once you come out, you, you might have a few friends and you might have a few undergrads that you have sort of taught during the postgrad. And, and, but that's, that's not enough to, to, to earn a living out uh, as a referral based pra- in, in referral based practice. So, um, so, so most, Postgrads, um, understandably, most graduates after yeah, postgrad, uh, understandably, um, start uh, at um, at other specialist practices, um, uh, which I think is, is 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 the right way. It's like you know, you know, as a general dentist, when you graduate, um, no one would go and open up their own practice. You know, just you just need to learn the the process, and you just need to learn how things work. Uh, it's just a different environment, obviously, but uh, but still that learning curve exists. And also you just need to, you know, you need to build up your confidence. Um, um, it's uh, the, the way you treat patients or, <clears throat> uh, you know, deal with it uh, in the hospital system and on the training situation is certainly different than, you know, in a, in a private setting when you're involved, you know, with the patient financially. Uh, so those are the things that even if you have worked uh, quite a long time as a general dentist and you have that that sort of experience, but still uh, as a specialist is, is different. And also the, the challenge is that as a specialist, you have two uh, groups of people to satisfy uh, and, and once your you, your patients and then your referring dentist. I mean, your referring colleagues, uh, obviously they, they see your work and they see the outcome of your work and, and the <clears throat> They get feedback from the from the patients, you know, um, and uh, so you have to, um, you know, you have to you have to present yourself as as someone that is um, confident and someone that can do and can can help if if they are in need. So, uh, and that's you know that that that's a lot of pressure, especially as as a new specialist uh, graduating coming into into the world of the uh, sort of specialist uh, dental. So. Uh, um, but but I guess you know most people find their way and you know you, you gradually build up your confidence and then uh, then then there will be a time that some people start their own uh, practice or some might decide just just to continue to you know to work with uh, with a different you know, with a, with a, with a group practice or you know with uh, um, other people as the owners problem. <clears throat> yeah, I mean you were studying. I mean, postgraduate in Melbourne, you're building, you're building connections, you're building, you know, you're tutoring like the undergraduates as well. You're building this network, but then you moved to Sydney. <laughs> That's actually quite right. So, um, uh, so that was a, a, a decision, a, like a family decision that we had to make for different, different reasons. And, and, and that was uh, f- from the, 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 my work aspect that was actually very hard, a very hard decision. So, uh, I mean, there were, there were pros and cons, and, and then eventually we decided that uh, we come to Sydney again for multiple reasons. But then, um, then it, my my job was much harder here because I I pretty much knew no one, and um, especially that I had not done my undergrad here, so I I didn't even have any friends from the undergrad days. Yeah. So. So uh, it, it was hard, but again, um, I think it, it's, a, it's a gradual and, and slow process and, you know, you just uh, uh, gradually build it up and, and, and thankfully it worked out fine. 
Yeah, like, I mean, that's kudos to you, you know, coming from a foreign country, coming to Australia, and then, you know, you're, you're, you're just constantly, um, you know, pushing yourself yep. into these tough environments and you're still thriving in these environments. It, it so, was tough, uh, so, but, but this is the last stop. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done it enough. <laughs> yeah, so you're working, so like you say, you go through the same kind of process, you go work for a group of specialists, you're kind of learning from those senior above you and you're kind of building this connection. And now you're in a situation where you're, um, the opportunity of opening up your sh own shop comes mm -hmm. about. And tell me about that. You know, what are you thinking? Like. Because that, that's probably something that some specialists also, you know, who are graduating thinking about too at some point. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think if, you're, um, if you want to have your own office um, and basically be your own boss, if you have that mentality, I mean, and there's not, nothing wrong about not having that mentality, I think it's a very, very personal decision and again, very, very multifactorial. So, um, for, for me personally, it was uh, I thought that that's the way to go, and and uh, um, I think it, it 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 comes a time that you you feel that um, uh, probably clinically you you have that you have built up the the, the confidence, and also um, you you probably um, know enough people to to um, to start the process, and and then you know let make them aware that that you know you have opened up your own office and and then um and then start from there and but but uh, it, for most people and, and it was the same for me um it's it's probably hard to to start your own office and then basically just work from that office from day one you know you still need to do you know a few days here and there um and um uh, and um, at the time, I think I was working, I was doing even like once, a, I'm, I'm living in Sydney, what I was doing once a fortnight in Wollongong, I was working in Campbelltown, I was working in Parramatta. So especially as, as, a, uh, as a specialist, I think it's, if, if you're lucky enough to work, you know, to, to start in one place and just stay in, in, around that suburb, I think that's, that's obviously good, but most of the time it doesn't happen. And um I, I traveled a lot um and i think that's at the time it was it was it was hard to do a lot of traveling between different practices uh but i think the good thing about it was that i, I actually got exposed to you know a, 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 a much wider um you know uh, group of dentists you know in in terms of different locations and and then so when I was working in Wollongong, you know, people in Wollongong got to know me when I was working in Parramatta, people in West and Campbelltown, people in Southwest. And so basically then that, that all helped, I think, you know, eventually when I opened my office, even though that, you know, people from, I um, probably have maybe just uh, less than a handful of people that are still referring from Wollongong to chats with, and I, 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 I have this joke with them that you know what you, you don't have to <laughs> because you know so the, you don't have to convince your patients and but then we have built up this this personal relationship and they, they trust me so they're kind enough to to convince the patient to come all the way to see me but um, um so even though that they don't they don't necessarily end up being the re refers once you open up your office it's it's all about the word you know the 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 word of mouth and also you know they they have colleagues and they talk to their colleagues and you know their colleagues talk to their colleagues and you know or they have mutual patients here and there on the dentist working from different locations so so i've had many um referring dentists that um <clears throat> i have many referring dentists now that um for example at the time they were working in you know close to wollongong yeah, and now they, they're in chatswood so uh, you know and, and then uh, they realized that oh i'm in chatswood so they, they i got this referral from them it was like well this guy was used to used to work in wollongong how come they in pacific smart chatswood well you know they moved so like 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 i did so um yeah eventually once you you know people know you and and they like you and they trust you i think they they refer you and and there's there's I think there's enough dentists around and um, that, um, you know, as a specialist, you, you know, you, you, you can't, obviously you can't keep everyone and you can't make everyone happy. But I think 
there will be some people that uh, like me, like my way of working, or you know, and and there will be uh, some people that like uh, John Smith's uh, uh, way of working, and there will be their lawyer referrer, and there will be some that would be my lawyer referrer. Mm, I see. So I want to change um, a little bit. So there's so much content out there, right? I mean, in terms of CPD courses, and you know. For a dentist to kind of pick what kind of CPD courses uh, that are best suited for them, what would you say? Um, <clears throat> it depends on if you're getting into a totally new um, um, area that you haven't really been exposed to before, or it's something that you already know and you want to sort of uh, master a bit more in it. So for example, um, you know, as, as a freshly graduated general dentist, you really haven't been exposed to, to implants. So you really need to, um, th that's a different scenario that if you are, for example, looking into advancing your skills in, in endo, because at least you have done some endo and you, you have definitely more understanding of endo as opposed to implants. So I think that's, uh, it, it's sort of, uh, the, the, the journey would be different for something that's you haven't really been exposed to. I think um, um, probably, up, in my opinion, the right way to do would be just 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 um, to attend um, you know a few short courses, like one or two days, just to 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 get an idea, to get a bit of a glimpse of what the whole uh, hype is about, and and whether you're actually it's something that that interests you or not before committing to a, a, a more sort of long term or probably more costly sort of uh, uh, diploma or, 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 or course. Um, but once you've done a few um, uh, sort of short weekend courses and, and you, you feel that, you know, that's something that interests you, I think that it, it's best to, to invest in, in a proper uh, sort of learning process, you know, different fields, obviously, uh, the different, you know, learning opportunities are um, available. Some you know, might be through ADA, some might be through unis, or even some very good sort of private, um, you know, education facilities now exist. And, and, and that's actually, that's actually amazing, because I think that, yeah, th again, this is, this is something that wasn't really there even like five years ago, even like certainly not 10 years ago. So um, I, I personally <clears throat> um, um, cherish, and I personally, I think, um, happy with the fact that the education is not anymore just happening through the unis um, uh, because you know even though that's the, the, the official formal education is good but I think in this day and age um, you know similar to what has happened to you know we, we probably don't really look into physical textbook much anymore you know everything is online uh, that, that is something that you know has happened to our uh, education process as well although that is you, you need to have a formal education and a formal degree but then advancing that uh, doesn't really have to be through a very formal system um, and, and uh, you know um, you can you can use different uh, platforms to 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 learn from and and I think by having that variety you actually get exposed to to uh, things that you probably um, you know wouldn't be exposed if you just go through one of those platforms or if you go through a, a uni process necessarily. So um, I think that, 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 that it's good that there's, you know, abundance of options out there. Uh, uh, you know, certainly you have to do your, your research and, and basically talk to people <clears throat> who have done different courses to find out, for example, you know, if you want to do something about implants and if you want to do something long-term about implants, uh, more of a, a diploma type thing rather than just a short weekend course, um, you know, which of the ones that are available in, let's say in Australia are, are probably, you know, more solid. So you have to do your research and, and find out which one suits you. But, uh, but the fact that there's this abundance of opportunities, I think that's, that's good. And that also creates um, competition and, and that makes the educators actually work harder, uh, which when things go just through uni, I think, because because of that lack of competition, I think sometimes you you just feel that the system is a bit slack and a bit you know it's just not really updating themselves 
just because and, and I'm involved in uni teaching as well. So and don't get me wrong, but I think that's just sometimes that, that, that when the system, it doesn't have much competition, it just gets a little bit stuck and and, it, and resistant to change. Whereas uh, when there are multiple options around and uh, a bit of competition that actually, you know, makes us educators to 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 actually work harder and, and try to deliver better, better education. Yeah, I mean, talk to me because you're in, there's not a lot of perio kind of courses out there, right? But you've run a soft tissue course in the past. You've yeah. run a foundation course that yeah. was a fair few modules. Can you talk to me about behind, you know, what your thoughts were behind that? Because you've talked about it a little bit, but in these ones in particular, how were you trying to structure these ones to kind of get people on board? Sure. Uh, well, we came up with this idea to to run it through ADA uh, to you know to be more accessible and and you know um, probably more affordable um, uh, because there was not um, such a thing around at least in Australia. I mean, that's um, um, and maybe even again five six years back there wasn't much uh, around the, around the globe about soft tissue probably like a, a proper course um but um but as you you must have seen and most of your audience uh, <clears throat> must have seen that uh, you know soft tissue has become a, a, a big thing you know over the past uh, five six seven years and, and 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 rightfully because you know we more and more we realize how important it is um, you know um, uh, around teeth and also around implants so um, so we felt that there's this gap in in in, in knowledge um, uh, that um, certainly for general dentists uh, uh, they don't get exposed at all, uh, and then they 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 get into trouble <clears throat> with their simple restorative work around the tooth that has a gingival problem, for example, um, to you know getting into trouble when you doing implants or you know further you know with your maintaining your implants. So. Um, so that that gap in knowledge basically just prompted us and, and a few of my colleagues to to come up with uh, uh, with that set course, and, and I'm sort of uh, working on a few other ones to to you know that hopefully by mid year or the end of this year you know we'll, we'll be able to 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 present it um, and to 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 put forward so that you know we, we can even have more options available and. Uh, and more courses for people to choose depending on the time and the, the amount of um, basic commitment they want to put into it. Yeah. So, of all, I mean, I want to come back to you for a second about has there been any particular CPD course that, that was a game changer for you that you were like, wow? Um, <clears throat> uh, no, no, I... I I can't. I can't think of one. Uh, I probably can think of few that have sort of shaped my way of, you know, doing a particular process, a uh, procedure. Uh, I can't think of one that I can say, well, that was the game changer. Um, and, and that's that's probably because, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of that that might happen more for a general dentist because you know they you have a you know, you have probably have a, 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 let's say not not in a bad way, a shallow level of informational knowledge about everything. Uh, but then, as as a as a specialist, you have probably a deeper knowledge about the smaller field. Uh, so that means then, so you once you get introduced to to new techniques or new materials and all that, so you don't you don't get surprised that much because you know you you have that sort of deeper knowledge about uh, the, about them. But then. Um, um, yeah, there, there have been few um, courses or, or people that you know I've met or learned from that have sort of influenced me um, greatly, and 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 uh, you know, and, and that's that has certainly helped to shape you know who I am now as, as a clinician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that more like the soft tissue side of things? Is that more the implant side of things, or is that someone within Australia, mm -hmm. someone overseas, like? Cool. Well, I, I think all around. Uh, I mean, uh, and 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 uh, we, with regards to different different topics. First of all, I, I think it's uh, for people who 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 know Stephen Chen. I have to uh, name him and, and give credit to him. Um, <clears throat> he was my uh, 
he was one of the mentors in in, in uh, Melbourne Uni. Uh, he's a periodontist, uh, experienced periodontist, and a, a, a very well respected implant uh, surgeon. And uh, he, up until last year, he was the um, head of the ITI for for four years. Um, so um, I, I was fortunate to have him as a mentor, as 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 part of postgrad. And and I think any any Melbourne uh, peri or postgrad. Um, would sort of say that that uh, that you know it was very good to have uh, Stephen as as one of our mentors, and I, I did my postgrad thesis with him as well, uh, which again you know made him made me sort of be more involved with with him uh, on, on a on a, a bit of a closer level, um, you know going to his practice, you know um, you know after work, you know to to just go through the, the my thesis and all that, so and also you know, doing the, the parts of the research that he needed to be directly involved in. So I think he, he sort of influenced me a lot um, uh, to, to be a, a better periodontist and a, a better clinician and probably, um, you know, um, help me to, to, to try to at least to try to, to think a little bit outside of the box sometimes. Uh, so I, I really give credit to him. I think that's if you want, want to name one person, that would be Stephen. That's that's incredible. Um, yeah. So, what's your kind of current ideal clinical day kind of looking like? What's the type of procedures you're kind of getting up to? Sure. Um, because I am, I think gradually you you tend to attract referrals. Um, more for the procedures that you 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 do more often, or you know you 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 enjoy more. So, um, so because I'm. I, I enjoy soft tissue work quite a lot, and and uh, um, uh, I'll probably talk talk to, uh, about soft tissue a lot, and or gave lectures or you know CPD courses about it. So um, I do get a lot of referral uh, f- uh, for that. I think the the general sort of perio side of the thing is is always there. Is is basically the bread and butter of of uh, periodontal practice. Uh, and and implants also the same. I think that's that's um, that's happens on a on a routine basis. Um, uh, but then the, my personal interest, I think, is in soft tissue, and I do enjoy quite a lot and to to play with it and then try different, you know, suturing techniques and 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 uh, try to you know um, uh, to to be better every time that I, I do it and then try to uh, to sort of. Uh, uh, I sometimes even, you know, um, spend a lot of time looking at the photos after the surgery, um, you know, in high magnification and, and uh, z- zoom in, you know, five times just to look at my the, the 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 knots on my sutures or you know where, for example, the flap was slightly torn or why it it happened or how how can I do it better next time or how can I avoid this this issue or we, you know when we get a complication just. You know, going through that and, and thinking about it, just try to to minimize it next time. So, um, yeah. So that that part, I think I really enjoy, and I uh, because I enjoy it, I, I I talk about it a lot, and I present uh, a lot about it, and and I get a lot of referrals about it, which I'm happy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, if you could share some words of wisdom to your younger self, what would it be? Um. I think I would say if you have a particular interest, um, um, and if, you, if, for example, if you are thinking of, about specializing, if, if you find your interest in something, uh, and that the, the proper way of doing it would be specializing, don't uh, don't hesitate. I think that the, the three years um, of um, no income and and maybe even paying tuition fees and and uh, probably struggling financially. Uh, first of all, it will definitely pay off financially later on. Uh, but then, um, uh, uh, I think personally, I've, I've, I've always been a, a, a person that I wanted to get sort of deeper into what I, what I do. So I probably would have gone crazy if I was a general dentist because I couldn't be good at all those different types of procedures. And and so uh, I think for me, it was the right choice to, to, to specialize because I wanted to do a smaller, you know, uh, probably variety of procedures, but, but be, be good at them. 
and 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 um, and if someone has that sort of mentality, I think uh, don't hesitate because uh, uh, it's dentistry is just changing so much and there's so much knowledge and there's so much uh, uh, stuff out there that you know it's just um, you know it's just so overwhelming and and you can't be you know you can't be good at good at all of that and and then uh, if you have that sort of sort of perfectionist mentality which we probably all share to some extent and that's why we're dentists then you might uh, you might struggle uh, mentally if, if you can't be good at all of that so even if you don't want to specialize you know just pick those areas of interest that you you think you're good at and that interests you and and you know makes you excited uh, and even if you're physically tired after if, if after a procedure at least you're you know mentally satisfied that you you have done that and you have done it better than last time if, if, if you're going through that i think you're in the right direction awesome well dr Hassan maladi thank you for coming on the show today if you could let the people know how they can find you or what you've kind of got going on in your life sure so um um so my practice is in chatswood i'm now in full-time private practice although i sort of help the uh sydney uni grad dip uh uh implant uh course uh on a part-time basis and have people who are sort of on mentor throughout that um so um if you know people your audience are in sydney and uh, feel free to to get in touch with me uh, my email address is uh, dr melati at uh, precision um and um, my website our web practice website is precision um or just search my name and you, you certainly find me in chatswood um and um you know feel free to come for a visit we, we have visitors and we have people coming to observe all the time so um we're pretty open to that awesome we'll definitely leave in the show notes below so for <laughs> our viewers if you like this episode drop a comment below on your favorite part but don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode of cpd junkie podcast thank you Thank you, Lawrence, for having me.